Hi everyone, my name is Kate and I'm here at the Eastside Freedom Library in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I have three books for you today. And the first one is called Harvesting Hope, the story of Cesar Chavez. All of the books today have really, really great pictures, especially this one. So, until Cesar Chavez was 10, every summer night was like a fiesta. R relatives swarmed on the ranch with, for barbecues, with watermelon, lemonade, and fresh corn. Cesar and his brothers and sisters and cousins settled down to sleep outside under the netting to keep mosquitoes out. But who could sleep with aunts and uncles singing, spinning ghost stories, and telling magical tales of life back in Mexico? Cesar thought the whole world belonged to his family. The 80 acres of their ranch were an island in the shimmering Arizona desert, and the starry skies were all their own. Many years earlier, Cesar's grandfather had built their spacious adobe house to last forever, with walls 18 inches thick. A vegetable garden, cows, and chickens supplied all the food they could want. With hundreds of cousins on farms nearby, there was always someone to play with. And Cesar's best friend was his brother Richard, they never spent a day apart. Cesar was so happy at home that he was a little afraid when school started. On his first day, he grabbed the seat next to his older sister, Rita. The teacher moved him to another seat, and Cesar flew out the door and ran home. It took three days of coaxing for him to return to school and take his place with the other first graders. Cesar was stubborn, but he was not a fighter. His mother cautioned her children against fighting and urged them to use their minds and their mouths to work out conflict. Then, in 1937, the summer Cesar was 10, the trees around the ranch began to wilt. The sun baked the farm soil rock hard. A drought was choking the life out of Arizona. Without water for crops, uh, the Chavez family couldn't make money to pay its bills, so a drought is when it doesn't rain as much as it usually does, so the ground got really dry. There came a day when Cesar's mother couldn't stop crying. In a day, Cesar watched his father strap their possessions onto the roof of their old car, and after a long struggle, the family no longer owned the ranch. They had no choice but to join the hundreds of thousands of people fleeing to the green valleys of California to look for work. Cesar's old life had vanished, and now he and his family were migrants, working on other people's farms, crisscrossing California, picking whatever fruits and vegetables were in season. When the Chavez family arrived at their first of their new homes in California, they found a battered old shed. Its doors were missing, and garbage covered the dirt floor. Cold, damp air seeped into their bedding and clothes, and they shared water and outdoor toilets with dozens of other, other families, and overcrowding made everything filthy. Their neighbors were constantly fighting, and the noise upset Cesar. He had no place to play games with Richard, and meals were sometimes made of dandelion greens gathered from along the roads. <clears throat> you imagine they have to pick dandelion greens from along the roads, even though they're working in fields with lots of vegetables. So Cesar fought, swallowed his bitter homesickness and worked alongside his family. He was small and not very strong, but still a fierce worker. Nearly every crop caused torment. Yanking out beets broke the skin between his thumb and index finger. Grapevines sprayed with bug-killing chemicals made his eyes sting and his lungs wheeze. Lettuce had to be the worst. Thinning lettuce all day with short-handled hoe would make hot spasms shoot through his back. Farm chores on someone else's farm instead of his own felt like a form of slavery. The Chavez family talked constantly of saving enough money to buy back their ranch, but each sundown, the whole family had earned as little as 30 cents for a day's work. As the years blurred together, they spoke of the ranch less and less. <clears throat> the towns weren't much better than the fields. White trade-only signs displayed in many stores and restaurants. None of the 35 schools Cesar attended over the years felt like a safe place, either. Once, after Cesar broke the rules about speaking English at all times, a teacher hung a sign on him that read, I am a clown. I speak Spanish. He came to, school, he came to hate school because of the conflicts, though he liked to learn. He even considered his eighth grade education a miracle. After eighth grade, he dropped out to work in the fields full time. 
His lack of schooling embarrassed Cesar for the rest of his life, but as a teenager, he wanted to put food on his family's table. He worked, as he worked, it disturbed him that landowners treated their workers more like farm tools than human beings. They provided no clean drinking water, rest periods, or access to bathrooms. Anyone who complained was fired, beaten up, or sometimes even murdered. So, like other migrant workers, Cesar was afraid and suspicious whenever outsiders showed up trying to help. How could they know about feeling so powerless? Who could battle such odds? Yet Cesar never forgot his old life in Arizona and the jolt he'd felt when it was turned upside down. Farm work did not have to be this miserable. Reluctantly, he started to pay attention to the outsiders. He began to think maybe there was hope, and in his early 20s, he, dedicated, he decided to dedicate the rest of his life to fighting for change. Again, he crisscrossed California, this time to talk people into joining his fight. At first, out of every hundred workers he talked to, perhaps one would agree with him. But one by one, this was how he started. At, first, at the first meeting Cesar organized, a dozen woman, women gathered. He sat quietly in a corner, and after 20 minutes, everyone started wondering when the organizer would show up. Cesar thought he might die of embarrassment. Well, I'm the organizer, he said, and forced himself to keep talking, hoping to inspire respect with his new suit and the mustache he was trying to grow. The women listened politely, and he was sure they did so out of pity. But despite his shyness, Cesar showed a knack for solving problems. People trusted him. With workers, he was endlessly patient and compassionate, and with landowners, he was stubborn and demanding and single-minded. He was learning to be a fighter. In a fight for justice, he told everyone, truth was a better weapon than violence. Nonviolence, he said, takes more guts. It meant using imagination to find ways to overcome powerlessness. More and more people listened. And one night, 150 people poured into an old abandoned theater in Fresno. At this first meeting of the National Farm Workers Association, Cesar unveiled its flag, a bold black eagle, the sacred bird of the Aztec Indians. La Casa, the cause, was born. It was time to rebel, and the place was Delano. Here, in the heart of the lush San Joaquin Valley, Brilliant green vineyards reached toward every horizon. Poorly paid workers hunched over grapevines for most of each year. And then in 1965, the vineyard owners cut pay even further. Cesar chose to fight just one of the 40 landowners, hopeful the others would get the message. As plump grapes drooped, thousands of workers walked off that company's field in a strike or huelga. Grapes, when ripe, do not last that long. The company fought back with everything from punches to bullets. Cesar refused to resp uh, respond with violence. Violence would only hurt La Casa. Instead, he organized a march, a march of more than 300 miles. He and his supporters would walk from Delano to the state capitol in Sacramento to ask for the government's help. Cesar and 67 others started out one morning. At first, their first obstacle was the Delano police force, 30 of whose members locked arms to prevent the group from crossing the street. After three hours of arguing in public, the chief of police backed down. Joyous, the marchers headed on north under the sizzling sun. Their rallying cry was, si se puede, or yes, it can be done. The first night, they reached Ducor. The marchers slept outside in the tiny cabin of the only person who would welcome them. Single file, they continued, covering an average of 15 miles a day. They inched their way through the San Joaquin Valley while the unharvested grapes in Delano turned white with mold. Cesar developed painful blisters right away. He and many others had blood seeping out of their shoes. The word spread. Along the way, farm workers offered food and drink as the marchers passed by. And when the sun set, marchers lit candles and kept going. Shelter was no longer a problem. Supporters began welcoming them each night with feasts. Every night was a rally. Our pilgrimage is the, mat is the match, said one speaker, and the light that will light our cause for all the farm workers to see what's happening here. Another cried, we seek our basic God-given rights as human beings. Viva la casa. Eager supporters would keep their mar marchers up half the night talking about change, and every morning the line of marchers swelled. 
Caesar, always in the lead. On the ninth day, hundreds marched through Fresno. The long, peaceful march was a shock to people unaware of how California farm workers had to live. Now students, public officials, religious leaders, and citizens from everywhere offered to help. For the grape company, the publicity was becoming unbearable. And on the vines, the grapes continued to rot. In Modesto, on the 15th day, an exhilarated crowd celebrated Cesar's 38th birthday. Two days later, 5,000 people met the marchers in Stockton with flowers, guitars, and accordions. That evening, Cesar re received a message that he was sure was a prank, but in case it was true, he left the march and had someone drive him all the way through the night to a mansion in wealthy Bever Beverly Hills. Officials from the grape company were waiting for him. They were ready to recognize the authority of the National Farm Workers Association, promising a contract with a pay raise and better conditions. Cesar rushed back to join the march. On Easter Sunday, when the marchers arrived in Sacramento, the parade was 10,000 people strong. From the steps of the state capitol building, the joyous announcement was made to the public. Cesar Chavez had signed the first contract for farm workers in American history. The parade erupted into a giant fiesta. Crowds swarmed the steps, some people cheering, many weeping. Prancing horses carried men in mariachi outfits. Everyone sang and waved flowers or flags. They made a place of honor for 57 marchers who had walked the entire journey. Speaker after speaker, addressing the audience in Spanish and in English, took the microphone. You cannot close your eyes and your ears to us any longer, cried one. You cannot pretend that we don't exist. The crowd celebrated until the sky was full of stars. The march had taken its toll. Cesar's legs, leg was swollen and he was running a high fever. Gently, he reminded everyone that the battle was not over. It is well to remember there must be courage, but also that in victory there must be humility. That means not being too proud or to, to know that you're not the most important thing in the world. Much more work laid ahead, but the victory was stunning. Some of the wealthiest people in the country had been forced to recognize some of the poorest as human beings. Cesar Chavez had won this fight without violence, and he would never be powerless again. Okay, our next story is called Dreamers by Yui Morales. This also has really beautiful pictures in it. I dreamed of you, and then you appeared, and together we became a more resplendent life, you and I. One day, we bundled gifts in our backpack and crossed a bridge outstretched like the universe. Adios, corazón. And when we made it to the other side, thirsty, in awe, unable to go back, we became immigrants. Migrantes, you and I. The sky and the land welcomed us in words unlike those of our ancestors. There were so many things we didn't know. Unable to understand and afraid to speak, we made a lot of mistakes. You and I became caminantes. Thousands and thousands of steps we took around this land until we found a place we had never seen before. Suspicious, improbable, unbelievable, surprising. Unimaginable. Where we didn't need to speak, we only needed to trust. And we did. Now, where do you think that place that they found was? I think it was a library. Books became our language. Books became our home. Books became our lives. We learned to read. To speak and to write and to make our voices heard. Someday we'll become something we haven't even ima yet imagined. But right now, we are stories. We are two languages, 
we are lucha, we are resilience, we are hope, we are dreamers, soñadores of the world, we are love, amor, love. Okay, and my third story today is about a neighborhood that's pretty close by to us, relatively speaking, in St. Paul. It's called the Rondo neighborhood, and it was written by Dr. Artika Tyner. And it was signed by the author to the Eastside Freedom Library. Thank you for collecting, sharing, and embracing the traditions of all, it says. Saturday morning, visiting Grandpa was the highlight of Joey's week. He did a daily count. One, two, three, four, five, until he reached the number six. The sixth day was Saturday. Joey woke up early every Saturday. He was excited to spend time with his grandpa. Wake up, Joey, it's time for breakfast, Mama said. Joey could smell in the air his favorite foods, pancakes and bacon. He got quickly dressed and brushed his teeth, and he packed his brown backpack with his pencil and notepad. He placed it on his back and ran down the stairs and greeted Mama with a big hug. Good morning, Mama and Papa, Joey said. Good morning, little Joey, they said in unison. Papa continued to flip pancakes and talked about the, how the Johnson family had moved to the Rondo neighborhood in the early 1920s. Joey began eating his breakfast in a hurried manner and gulped his freshly squeezed orange juice with a big sigh. Slow down, Joey, and chew your food. That's bad table manners, Papa said. Joey nodded shyly and began to chew more deliberately. Excitement was bubbling in his belly. Soon it would be grandpa time. Mama smiled knowingly. Every Saturday, Joey was in a hurry to get to Grandpa Johnson's house. Joey, what are you gonna do today with your grandpa? Mama inquired. Joey leapt to his feet and said, Grandpa told me today we're gonna to visit a few of his friends in Rondo. He grabbed his backpack and waited for Papa to put on his shoes and jacket. Papa walked Joey a few blocks down Dale Street to Grandpa's house. On the way, his neighbors, Miss Bertha and Miss Thelma, were working in the garden and sweeping their front steps. They greeted Joey with a beaming smile and waved as he passed by. Good to see you, Joey. Hope you have fun with your grandpa today. He waved and responded, thank you, ma'am, as he briskly walked toward grandpa's front gate. Grandpa, grandpa, Joey shouted with joy. I'm in the back, grandpa replied. He walked hand in hand with Papa to the back. Grandpa was working on his car. He turned with open arms and Joey ran into them. Grandpa lifted him high in the sky and made an airplane noise. Swoosh, swoosh. Joey closed his eyes as the cool air brushed across his face. You can soar, Grandpa whispered in his ear. Jo Joey, in a soft voice that rang like a beautiful song in the air, declared, soar to new heights. Grandpa made a gesture of slow descent. Joey gently landed back on his feet. Joey loved when Grandpa let him soar. He felt free as a bird, light as a feather, and strong as the wind. Papa waved goodbye to Grandpa and Joey. He knew they were now in their own world, filled with excitement and adventure. Joey and Grandpa began their first st stop at Hallie Q. Brown Center, a community gathering place where Grandpa stopped to greet his friends and neighbors. Joey was excited and could not wait to see the other children playing sports, creating music, and making crafts. The place was bustling with activities. Joey now had an opportunity to play on the playground with his friends, and Grandpa described the Hallie Q. Brown Center as the place where the village comes together. As they said their goodbyes, Joey looked at the big letters in the front of the building. He sounded out the words, stumbling quite a few times, and he bashfully stated, Hallie Q. Brown. Grandpa said, you're doing such a good job with your reading. Joey beamed with confidence, but he began to ponder, who is Miss Hallie? Out of all his visits, he had never met her. With a curious look in his eyes, he asked Grandpa, Who is Hallie Q. Brown? Grandpa said, Grab your notebook and let's have a seat. They sat together on a bench and Joey could not wait. He would get to play the role of a journalist. Grandpa closed his eyes and began to share about his friend. Hallie was a great educator, an orator, that means speaker, 
She wrote books, taught generations of young people, and created the National Association of Colored Women so that the voices of black women could be heard. When she spoke, I could feel a stirring in my soul, and I found myself shouting, Amen. After he answered all of Joey's questions, Grandpa stood and extended his hand. They were on their way to the Johnson Brothers Barbershop, which is a family-owned business. Joey's grandpa owned the barbershop over 20 years ago when he first moved to Rondo. Uncle Charles runs the barbershop now. Good morning, little Joey. Happy to see you. Are you enjoying time with your grandpa, Uncle Charles asked. Joey smiled from ear to ear. Yes, sir. Uncle Charles had a special chair waiting for Joey and grandpa, a big green one. It's time for grandpa's weekly shave and Joey's weekly haircut. Before grandpa takes a seat, he greets everyone in the shop. He shares hugs, handshakes, and a few jokes. He's finally ready for Uncle Charles to work his magic. Joey is next in line, and he leaves the barbershop with a fresh new cut. After the barbershop they visit, they walk down to the Credjafon Co-op store. Grandpa had to pick up a few vegetables for Sunday dinner, and Grandma cooked soul food every Sunday. Every Sunday. After church, the entire family would gather around a large oak table in their dining room. Joey could taste the delicious food and his mouth began to water. Smothered chicken, collard greens, candy yams, and macaroni and cheese. Joey walked hand in hand with Grandpa to the law offices of Frederick McGee. Grandpa had to pick a few contracts for his new business deals. When Joey entered the office, he was drawn to the photo of Frederick McGee with W.E.B. Du Bois and William Monroe Trotter. He remembered Grandpa describing Frederick McGee as someone who fought for justice. He was a founding member of the St. Peter Claver Church and founded the first chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and, which is called the NAACP, in Minnesota. Joey stood in front of the photo and beamed with admiration. Just as he looked up, Mr. McGee waved at Joey, and he walked into his next client meeting and said, Great to see a future lawyer in the office today. As the sun went down, Joey knew his time with Grandpa was coming to an end. He, hung, he hung his head low in disappointment and slowly dragged his feet. They headed back to his house where he found his parents and his baby sister on the porch. Papa was reading the newspaper. He greeted, Joey, he greeted Grandpa and asked Joey about his day. Joey responded with a question, Why do Saturdays have to go so fast? Grandpa, Mama, and Papa laughed and cherished the beauty of childhood. Joey recounted each of his visits. He shared about visiting the local business in Rondo, and Grandpa reminded him of another lesson with a gentle hint. Did you learn a new word today? Joey declared with joy, Yes, entrepreneurship! And he began to spell it out. E-N-T-R-E-P-R-E-N-E-U-R-S-H-I-P. -E now, if you're learning how to spell, you know in English that is a word that doesn't play fair, they say. You can't sound that word out. You have to just remember how to spell it. Joey continued, it means creating business opportunities in your community. I want to be an entrepreneur one day, just like you, Grandpa, and I want to own my own restaurant since I love cooking soul food with Grandma, and I want to open a law firm just like Frederick McGee. I can create jobs in the community and help fight for justice. Grandpa said, this is also about being a leader. You're a great student, and leaders are learners, and so you're well on your way to being an entrepreneur. He handed Joey a special package, and Joey opened it and found a bundle of new books to read. Grandpa waved goodbye, and Joey began counting the days until he would spend time with Grandpa. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, I think Joey wants to have about four different jobs. That's like my kid, Will. He wants to have four different jobs. He can't decide, but he has a lot of time. Um, so thank you so much for sitting with us today and listening to these books, and we will see you next week.